Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And I'm Tom Scholey. And we don't have a vintage reprint of Captain America, but we have this trade paperback and we want to take a look at Captain America issue number one. First, Jimmy, what do you have? Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, where you can see the comics that I make, how I make them, original art, scripts, all kinds of process talk. You can also download out of print, hard to find zines and mini comics at Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Tom, what do you have? Here's Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. You can learn about the creation of Fantastic... I mean, not... You can learn about the creation of Captain America uh, in the very pages of this this life story of Jack Kirby. Uh, I also have Fantastic Four Grand Design, uh, another Kirby favorite. Uh, The Fantastic Four, uh, their whole story retold uh, by me. Um, I do all the the writing, drawing, and and colors and lettering myself. Uh, You can also check out the new comics I'm working on at patreon.com just search tom Scholey and uh, my youtube channel total recall show boom that makes a nice screen yeah, those books does. next to each other red room comics in the wild murder on the dark web for fun and profit is the name of the game as of this recording three issues are on the stands as we speak and every issue is completely self-contained uh as of this recording, Free Comic Book Day is forthcoming. Uh, August 14th is when this comic is going to be available for the sum total of $0.00, and it's the best comic I've made to date. All original material that kind of leads into the various issues of Red Room comics that are out there uh, on the stands right now. I could order these comics from Fantagraphics if you don't have a good comic shop, or you can hit up my Patreon, read the comics online for 3 bucks. Uh, for the whole archive, put out new strips every Tuesday. That's patreon.com slash edpiscor. And you can get there uh, by way of my link tree in the description below this video. Fellas, Captain America Comics, number one. March, what is it, 1941? 1940. Yeah, you're right, 1940. Simon and Kirby created this package, pause, and uh, sold it to Mr. Marty Goodman. Came a smash hit, dude. Made uh, Kirby a superstar cartoonist. From this point forward, yeah, it was their their you know first big hit. It's a really interesting comic in that we think of Kirby and Marvel and Captain America and yep. Marvel, and yet there's like 20 years between Marvel Universe and this comic, and it brings you really close to like those Golden Age characters. You know, the, the comic format was not worked out. The comic book format was not worked out at this point, so it's kind of interesting to go back and revisit this because it is not your 60s Silver Age Marvel. This is a whole different beast. Yeah, this this comic, if you take it as a whole, like the backups included, makes a really strong case for you know um, Jack Kirby as being the the major author of that later '60s Marvel stuff. Because a lot of elements that end up in in the '60s stuff that are usually you know credited to Stan Lee are here in, in a product that Stan Lee had nothing to do with. You'll bring some of that up yeah. uh, as as we go forward, man. Uh, one thing that's super fun is that because this is 1940. This is extremely raw, beyond just the aesthetics of the artwork. The storytelling is all over the place and confusing and weird compositions. Kirby will figure all of that shit out later. Like, there's this curio shop, (laughs) and it's, like, a little unclear what the heck you're even looking at, you know? Um, There's a lot of that sort of stuff here. It's fun seeing uh, him sort of figuring that part of the comics-making process out, but... We'll definitely try to point out some of those examples because there's stuff where word balloons are in different order. There's stuff where arrows are used to, you know, lead us to the proper uh, panel. But yes, it was weird reading this because there are these panels that don't line up horizontally and trying to even figure out like which panel is next is sometimes a challenge. Yeah, I mean, I, I find this comic extremely readable, extremely enjoyable, extremely fun. Like none of those things were like a barrier to me. And again, it's like something I'm well acquainted with to begin with. So, you know. I wonder if it was commonplace to have like a Roosevelt or something like in the comic book medium, obviously long lineage and editorial illustration, things like this, but uh, I don't seem to remember, you know, Roosevelt showing up in earlier Superman comics or anything. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of innovation going on. And one of the things they kind of point to is um, Roosevelt saying, okay, you got your comic strip character or your comic book characters, like the human torch, we're not we're not talking about that. We're talking about real life. So like the idea of like somebody referencing comic book superheroes and that stuff's all phony, but now you're reading like this this is like torn from the headlines. I really like this drawing of the old lady uh who's, who's the keeper of this shop, but 
What a good face. All it's of the uh, cartooned and stuff. Very fun. All of the cloak and dagger stuff. Yeah. Fascinates me because mm -hmm. I wonder like how deep some of that stuff went in real life or is this is just pure imagination like uh, you know, there's the Wemco building you guys have to drive by to get here. Like, that was supposed to be some sort of, like, military industrial operation mm -hmm. back in the day. And, and you know, it, under the guise of something else. So, like, I love this idea of just, like, a little mom-and-pop shop. Lady takes off her gear and is, you know, femme scientist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love that drawing, too. Like, having the two eyes line up and the divided mm -hmm. face. This is fun drawing. This is super uh, cool. Go see Comic Book Confidential documentary, and you get to watch and listen to Jack Kirby reading this page. It has such a different, stronger, more powerful resonance hearing it in in his his voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this the, and this stuff is all like iconic and pretty much survives intact in like the retellings of this story, and and even even into like the movie. And like I was thinking <laughs> on on this read through that like. You know, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby are pretty young guys. Like, you know, puberty wasn't that far behind to them. So, like, this idea of, like, being this kind of, like, skinny kid, and then one day you wake up and, That's like, really your body's all changed. There's also, uh, there, there is funny stereotypes in that, because what, what's it called when, when you're not fit for military service? Like, Oh, F yeah, 4F or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, skinny teacher... Uh, Steve Rogers and like the idea of like a male teacher is like yeah, a like lily livered wuss. Ichabod Crane, like right. that. Yeah. But you know, a teacher that that's a woman's profession. And uh, Professor Reinstein, and like like obviously modeled on Albert Einstein, but it's like young Albert Einstein. Like like Albert Einstein doesn't he look. Yeah, hair. he doesn't look like the iconic Einstein yet. Pretty unusual point of view for the the needle that's giving him the shot. It's so unusual. It's yeah. like coming right out at the reader, but also it's you're not seeing the tip of the needle. Yeah, a lot of a lot of just odd compositions that you know Kirby just he's figuring out his his stuff on the page, man. But it's it's like freewheeling and fun and and undisciplined in a way that's just really like great, like really perfect for for superhero comics. Just just there's like a rawness and a momentum to it. This kind of bounce, we'll call it momentum to use a mm -hmm. better adjective. Uh is synonymous with Simon and Kirby mm -hmm. to me. The kind of elastic kind of figure, kind of elongated, skinny, yeah. but still lean, rubbery. Lithe. There are a few examples of this where we'll see like the headlines used mm -hmm. for exposition and it works fine. Uh, but it's sort of like a convention that you'll see a couple of times in this comic. <laughs> and so his like Clark Kent is, you know, Steve Rogers as like like a military private. And look, it's like, America hasn't entered World War II yet, so look at the visuals. He's kind of drawing like a World War I army guy, you know, like like the visual vocabulary hasn't changed yet because you know because the reality has not a park ranger, up. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. He looks he looks like Yogi Bear's uh, uh, Ranger <laughs> and, Rick. And, or whatever and by the way, pouches were already big. By <laughs> the way, Bucky Barnes, mascot of the regiment. What's that mean? You, you like put this kid like on a chair and have four dudes like carrying him around, and, and, he, and, and the little boy like bangs the drum, and he's 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 getting everybody excited. He's the regiment hype man. He's just running around in circles. <laughs> what is a mascot of the regiment? I mean? wondered about that. If that's a real thing, it's so bizarre. Like I've never heard of that. Well, Jim, like like whenever we review like a Batman related thing, and Robin comes up, you always have a point a point of view about, and like I'm I'm curious about your point of view on this. Uh, the discovery of Steve Rogers. With the mere fact that as soon as a boy uh, discovers that he's Steve Rogers, like, Rogers has to now keep him close, no matter what the kid's qualifications. Well, th like, the thing I was thinking is, like, you know, ostensibly comic books, like, they're for kids, you hand them to a kid, and then you think about, okay, what lessons are you teaching to this kid? So, not a great lesson to teach kids that, like, if you walk in on a stranger in mid-dress or in a state of undress... And he says to you, let's make this our secret. <laughs> and then proceeds to like undress you and put you in a different outfit. Like, tell the nearest adult. You know, that should be part of the story. Man, it felt so much more innocent, Tom, until you explained this sequence. <laughs> well, I'm putting the it origin. through like You're right. You're I'm right. putting it through the like Jim Rug Robin filter. I agree with you now. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I did think about it reading this, though, because I have been very critical lately mm -hmm. of Batman-Robin relationship. Part of it is because this stuff is so different in tone. Mm 
-hmm. it doesn't stand out to me as being glaring. If this were to suddenly become dark and gritty, it might feel a little bit more inappropriate. But this is just so surface level. You know, we're, we're not seeing real characters here or real people in these roles. It's very much like little adventure. See, this feels kind of dark and gritty to me, like, especially in the context. Like, we're in almost like a horror world. Like, it's very shadowy. There's a lot of, like... You know, like even that 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 lady with like sort of like a witch face and a mask. And as the story goes on, you get the red skull. You know, like like it feels like we're and 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 that is sort of more like what the reputation timely had was that they did kind of like a little more lurid, a little bit trashier kind of comics than than the other. Yeah, I, I may be using the wrong word. It could be the the focus on pathos that we mm -hmm. would see in something like Frank Miller's Dark Knight. Yeah, uh, where there is a different approach to character and the depiction of character than what we see here. Like this feels like a little adventure cartoon, mm -hmm. even though it is a dark setting. Obviously, you know the the eve of World War II, uh, but it doesn't have that same sense of like, what are you doing with a child here? Even mm -hmm. the stuff where like you know they're being captured or somebody's being killed, it doesn't have that feeling of. I don't know, the 80s kind of focus on, again, pay right, reinve maybe. Reinventing it and, and tr trying to ground it in more of, like, a naturalism. Yeah, I think Bucky gets captured, like, three times. Like, that's his function. Yeah, but he's Robin. And, and again, they're just, okay, Batman and Robin. Here's our version. Yeah. You know? It's funny because, like, in other story conventions, maybe go to the 60s, it's the woman in distress. Mm -hmm. But here we have the child in distress, so... Chester Chester Gold exists in this time for about ten years, man, and there is definite like what they call f physiognomy to to like all villains. Like in a Simon Kirby Captain America comic, if there is a an undercover Nazi soldier posing as an American, you're gonna be able to <laughs> sniff that dude out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if yeah. you see the whole lineup of all the soldiers, you're gonna be able to tell which one the Nazi is, man. How disc dick esque is that panel oh, with yeah. all the eyes popping out. Oh yeah. And even and, Eisner, right? Like with some of that yeah. hatching and stuff. This is um like one of the earliest nineteen sixties Captain America comics. They like retell this story of, of Sando and Omar, I think they're called. And and uh you know, that's a that's a funny convention too, because the idea is that these Sando and Omar, they're, they're like uh, prognosticators. Uh, for, fortune teller guys are looking at a crystal ball and able to uh, imagine, like uh, tell everybody the future. And it's always future disasters. And you wonder, why? Like, 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 why, why would you, would, uh, if you're a bad guy and you just like, uh, rigged something. It's a very bizarre. Well, like, what's the purpose? Yeah, I mean, in, in plot terms in this, it's like they're communicating to like the agent who's going to do, so they're basically telling the agent, go blow up this bridge. And uh, then the agent goes, you know, blows up the bridge. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's more about, um, you know, just a, like a fun story gimmick. I love the panel of them running. <laughs> Like, <laughs> I'm not sure about Bucky's form there, but man, they are really running. <laughs> yeah, I mean, his run style is like Forrest Gump. Well, you know, like, in this era, there's, like, other artists whose work I just find, like, more attractive and more, you know, like, even, like, Siegel and Schuster, they kind of have, like, a like a ghostly, like, a very tasteful quality. This stuff, like, to my eye, was always, like, very, like, garish and trashy and wrong and bad, but, like... These are great comics, like I, you know, if, you know, punk rock or whatever, you know. Yeah, it's interesting stylistically. Kirby is much different when we think of him in his mature mm -hmm. stage, but extremely dedicated to like the dynamic qualities of these figures, just bouncing off each other, moving. You know, a lot of movement, even though he will express it differently in you know decades to come. Well, this will probably sound weird, but like a, like a value that Kirby's work has here, and then in his more mature work, is Kirby like overdraws. He draws too much. He draws like more than than, you know, good taste would would recommend or whatever. And so this is like the 1940s version. Like there's there's just like way too much going on and like a more tasteful approach would be to like hold back a little, but he gives you everything, which again in like a pulpy, you know, that like was a meat killer splash. Page. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like for a title page, that's a really good looking piece. And you got that great convention of like the chess pieces, you know, like in yeah. the, the Snake Eyes the mastermind. comic or whatever. <laughs> and, um, you know, this is kind of like a like an anthology, like a two-man anthology. And so and so it's nice because you get a reset every couple of pages and you get an opportunity for like like a splash page. I, you, I, I get the sense that they're figuring out the Captain America character a little bit more. This is the third Captain America adventure in, uh, in this issue. And it's starting to solidify a little bit more. They're getting more comfortable 
with the comic. Yeah, the cast starts to fill out. This is pretty hardcore. For uh, like, I don't remember yeah. very many Jack Kirby head wounds with <laughs> with blood gushing. And that guy's like tied to a rack. There, yeah, so and he's just still up. And just that dead face with the eyes open. I love something like look at that like shadow placement. Really, really great stuff. Yeah, and and like yeah, we're filling in the cast. I think. I think uh, Be Betty Ross has shown up, which again, like, okay, so that's a character, you know, Betty Ross, the name shows up in like the Hulk in the 60s. And it's like, oh, well, Stan Lee probably came up with the name Betty Ross. Well, it's like, no, Jack Kirby and, and Joe Simon came up with Betty Ross as, you know, like the heroine in these, you know, and, and obviously in a Captain America comic, it's like Betsy, Ro you know, it just sounds like Betsy Ross. Your arrows, uh, you know, talking <laughs> about arrows to lead lead the reader in yeah. the right direction. So there's an example of that. And, and there's the, quite a few of those. Yeah, where the last panel is right there. Like, <laughs> like a mature cartoonist just would never do that. You know, but just mm -hmm. trying to keep the pages exciting. Yeah, lots of like breaking the panel borders. And, and uh, you know, just like the kind of fun when you don't know better yet. Yeah. Also weird panel shapes. Yeah. You know, you see like... We're going to see some real wild ones here. And this is just, you know, they, 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 these are some hyperactive kids making this comic. Yeah, it feels like playing with the comic book page versus, say, aspiring to be a newspaper daily strip or something. Yeah. Yeah, taking advantage of this brand spanking new medium that, that you are helping to uh, invent the vocabulary. Of. I think there are a couple of notes that we'll see, and the notes feature different handwriting. So kudos to the detail work there. Oh, like, look at these panels, dude. <laughs> right? It's almost like he just drew the characters first and then, like, figured out ways to snake the uh, the panel borders around. Yeah, definitely unusual from what we're used to. In all of these stories, a few elements of comedy yeah. are thrown in there, usually with a Bucky character kicking somebody in the butt and stuff. I think they carry that on, right? Like, there's like yeah. a little uh, well, they pants de pantsing of Hitler, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, hot something. foots and stuff. Like, and that that was like an interesting thing I noticed, like reading through these, is like on the cover he's punching Hitler in the face, but like you never see that in any of the interior stories. In, in the interior stories, they always like defeat him in a way that humiliates him, and usually it's Bucky. Usually, like Captain America won't even sully his hands punching him. It's usually like yeah, you know, like he's like. Uh, a Bucky pulling down his pants or, or tripping tripping him or something. So you can see kind of the page layout stuff, right? Like where, you know, this was one I was always cautioned about is you could have a tall panel, but it needs to be on the left. Yeah. Because otherwise you go one, two, three, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's, that's the kiss of death for new comic readers. That's the thing where, where, you know, your civilian friends who say, I, I just don't know how to read comics. Like that's, what they're talking about. They came across comics that have that and then it confused them. And so like, think about all this stuff you're introducing in this, in this comic, like it, already it's like jam packed with like Captain America content. And then uh, you get, get introduced to all these elements and then you get the red skull too. Like it, it would be like if the Joker showed up in the first Batman comic. Red Skull looks nuts, and he's wearing like that swastika sweatshirt g gimmick. That he that he still wore in the '60s when when <laughs> when, they, when they brought him back. Definitely it's a funny outfit. A kind of like a crimson ghost. Yeah, looks, kind of yeah. kind of character like uh, the, you know, the and the imagination at that point from the serials. It only always only went to like mad scientist saboteur guy. It was never supernatural or it would anything be, like yeah, that. yeah, like a guy with a skull mask or guy, a guy with just like a hood. Yeah. With eye, eye holes cut out. And always just saboteurs and shit. Look at these guys getting fit for for duty, man. Yeah, and um, like we're not up yet to the, the trope of Steve Rogers being like even more like a Clark Kent, like a bumbler, always like annoying his, his superior officer. Yeah, I didn't know that that was like a character trait of him. Reading this makes me curious to read like issue 10 and yeah. see how far... They, yeah, they evolve. How comfortable they get. It, it's but here's more of your It's a notes, great body of work. You know, work. like the handwritten note by character, and again, different handwriting. Yeah, there was a story in the uh, comics by Les Daniels that was far more developed by Simon and Kirby. That's my impression. I can't remember what how it came up, but that was my impression is that they do develop some. Uh, yeah, was this like a quarterly comic or something? It, it wasn't monthly. Yeah, I th I think you're right. Like it. It sat, it sat, and they would they would like predate. They would date stuff in such a way that it would guarantee it to like sit on the shelf like longer than normal. Yeah. You know? So it has the cover date is like a 1941 cover date, even though it was made in like you know 1940. 
Um, and, and, and I say that just because issue 10 is like, you know, two years later. Yeah. Yeah, just it's really strong out of the gate. And then and then, yeah, they just get better as they go. on. It seems like Goodman uh, had had high hopes because there there are um, fan fan clubs yeah. and and get buttons and pins and wait for next issue. Uh, if you like Captain America, let's point you to some of our other titles. And, and go, here, go yeah. back one page, because here they talk about suicide. And it surprises me that in a kid's comic that would be okay. Mm -hmm. You know, like essentially Red Red Skull commits suicide, Captain America lets him do it, and they say it. It's not like yes. this is happening if you pay attention. It's like, nope, we're going to spell it out for you. This is like a, you know, the question or a Mr. A kind of moment where like the hero's supposed to stop the bad guy from killing himself or, you know, or catch him or what. And he's like, hey, I didn't do anything. And hey, you know, I'm not going to stop. You know, like, like that is like a very kind of like badass sort of, sort of uh, thing. So you're saying Fred Wortham was right, man? Kids can't be reading these <laughs> yeah, harmful uh, yeah, Oh, things. yes, especially a, a, a timely comic, yeah, for <laughs> sure. Um, and, and, and just, like, of note, when, prior to this, when Timely was publishing Submariner and Human Torch, they were outsourced. They were, they were commissioning this stuff from, from you know, outside creators. They, they, Captain America, they wanted to make comics in-house, and so they hired... Uh, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby to be the in-house comics creation team, and this is you know this is what we're seeing. So so uh, there were hopes that Hurricane would catch fire. Yeah, and Hur get his own title. Hurricane is they call him son, he's son of Thor in here. Like there's like you basically have almost all of like '60s Marvel in this one issue. You have like a Thor character, and it's even like there's that another like element that they sort of like credit to Stan Lee of like you have these like gods meeting kind of like the man on the street and that's jack wouldn't do that that's a, that's a stand touch stands but in hurricane this god the son of thor hurricane gets in a taxi cab this has this conversation with this salt to the earth like the exact kind of stuff that was going on in like a thor comic in the 60s so jack kirby and joe simon bring in that element uh you know 20 years earlier and and um cre creates this kind of worldview you have uh, Pluto, this sort of like Satan figure, which again shows up in in Thor, and then and, and it's almost almost also like a um, like a new gods kind of thing because this is like a new generation of gods, and and you know Pluto and and his little assistant guy is almost kind of like a Desad, you know, to, to Dark Side. There, there's just so much of Kirby's like themes and interests that are here that will continue to be developed, and and Hurricane was sort of like a sequel to another comic Simon and Kirby did for another publisher called Mercury. Yeah. Basically, another they just had to change the name of the character, but it p picks up the story right right where it left off. Tom, I'm noticing a lot of margin notes. Yes. Are these yours? These, yeah, these are my, this is my comic, and you'll if you go through my comic collection, you'll see a lot, because sometimes I'll read a comic, and then I'll get an idea and start... So, like, I had ideas for things you could do with... I could do in a Captain America comic if I did a Captain... So, if, if you zoom in close, you can maybe, <laughs> maybe see. So, are you saying you're going to go hit up... Uh the editors at Marvel and try to revive Tuck and Caveboy? Um, well, yeah, I, and Tuck, it says, translates to the word Avenger. So Tuck is the first Avenger. So even, like, you would think, like, oh, Stan Lee with his salesmanship, he was the guy who came up with the name The Avengers. Well, guess what? In, like, the first Marvel comic by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, Avenger is, is, is a big element. Adelan, the, the, where, where, the, uh, where the Inhumans are from in this issue. You know, so that's sick, man. And I'm probably missing a couple things too that are that are in here. It's know? so cool, man, because like this sort of storytelling uh, tool of cap heavy captioning with the imagery that is direct Hal Foster Tarzan mm -hmm. uh, influence, like. And this is like a Tarzan kind of yeah, setup. You yeah, know? exactly. I was going to say earlier, like this composition is Hal Foster. Mm -hmm. This composition is Hal Foster. I even seen Frazetta use that composition before man so that's that's what they're pulling from here pretty directly and i think that's pretty awesome does uh does does tuck make it to issue two um yeah those backups do continue into subsequent issues uh you know K kirby stops working on them you know at a certain point pretty early, like maybe as of like issue three yeah we're gonna stop at issue one but i just wanted to zoom ahead and take a look at some of that more mature Simon Kirby work. Yeah, and there's basically ah, there's, look. <laughs> there's three volumes this size of like the Simon and Kirby stuff. So so this is like one third of. Okay, of what so this is produced. just like issue four or five or something. Yeah, issue number four. And already like opening things up. 
That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, look at this. Getting the full splash in there. Yeah, I I don't know if there's a double splash in this first volume, a little later. but yeah. It's a good double splash, too. That first one's in that uh, Marvel uh, Les Daniels book that we, that we looked at. Anyhow, man, cool to dust off Captain America comics, number one. I guess we're going to have to um, bust out our Rob Liefeld Heroes Were Born ones uh, <laughs> for a future video, fellas. Man, you got anything? Any closing statements? K okay, favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, what's out there? Join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, where you can download out-of-print zines and mini-comics. You can see original art, process posts, scripts, how I make, Street Angel, Octobriana, and all the other comics I make on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Learn more about Jack Kirby and, and Captain America in Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. Learn more about Adelan and Avengers, who make an appearance in Fantastic Four Grand Design. And check out my YouTube channel, Total Recall Show. Red Room Comics are out on the stands as we speak. Three issues right now as of this recording. Every issue completely self-contained. Get the free Comic Book Day comic on August 14th. You could read these comics ahead of time on my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor, and all of these links are in my link tree in the description below this video. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Given those margin orders, Jimmy, we're going to be on our way. Read more comics.